cut content from Mushoku Tensei by any news. Let's see what he has to say. Rydius and Silphie's wedding wasn't so much about Rydius and Silphie, but was instead an opportunity to highlight all the people around them. It's hard to appreciate a cast as big as this, but when they're all in the same room and even interacting with each other, you best, you best believe we're going to get some interesting conversations out of them. That's Such the as? Of the cut content for this episode Nana Hoshi eating chips was pretty see, funny. It does well to develop a lot of the side characters. So whether it be Luke hitting on Nana Hoshi or Errol presenting her gifts, wait, 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 wait! <laughs> Luke and Nana Hoshi, really? Luke and Nana Hoshi, but Nana Hoshi is not even well endowed. I thought the gray rats don't get horny for people that's not voluptuous. Nana Hoshi is not really thick. Yeah, sure, you guys can say thighs, thighs, but honestly, she's pretty pinner. She's got no thighs. She just happened to show legs. That's it. Nana Hoshi is not busty. She got no ass. She got no thighs. But Luke is into him. Seems a little bit like a contradiction to the Grey Rat family. For Ariel presenting her gifts. The but what the fuck is these gifts, bro? What the fuck are these gifts? Presenting her gift. What the fuck are we getting gifted right here? Why is it blurred out? Surely it's not sex toys, right? What's going on here? Mm. The wedding reception was a rare opportunity to see more from everyone else. The scenes that Damn, Sophie looks really good there. Get into the anime, but ones I think you'll definitely appreciate. Before we get started, though, Add. if you've ever watched the ancient Add. Megas Bride, like I'm sure plenty of you, sure, have, you're definitely gonna want to see this. All right, you got a figurine ad. Go buy your figurine from Andy News using the discount code Andy News. Go go go. Last time. Go go go. Go go go. Go go go. Video. But anyway. Episode 38, Wedding Reception, covering chapters 5 to 7 from volume 10 of the light novel. The first and most important thing that needs to be mentioned is exactly what it is Rudy decided to do with the secret room down in the basement. What is Last it? Last episode I Sex mentioned dungeon it wasn't now. specified, but after reading a little more, it was confirmed to be a shrine. <laughs> a private room home to a secret altar, the contents of which were the- Bro. The shrine has a new private room, and the box that Rudy put in there was literally a cutout of the blanket sheet stained with the blood of Sylphie during their... Yep. The idols Rudy went and prayed to every day. Yep, idols, yeah. It was kept yeah. behind a door Rudy ensured was soundproof, so no matter how many times he went in or out, no one would suspect there was something else down in the basement. Okay. Now, it was a week after all these renovations had been completed that Rudy and Sylphie were able to spend some quality time together. Normally, Sylphie wouldn't have had time to do any of this, but after getting a week off thanks to Ariel, the two would spend all week together preparing for their upcoming reception. It was a week Rudy had hoped would be filled he with all sorts of Sylphie in bed members, here. but was instead non-stop work as arrangement after arrangement had to be made. Some of the concerns that weren't mentioned in the anime was the way certain people would react when seeing others, the seating order since there was a mix of people from royalty to adventurers, then of course the possibility that no one would even show up. This last Body Gotti. Stemmed from a he showed up later, though. From an anime, and it was a reference to this scene from Kyojin no Hoshi. Basically, what? the main character put all this work into setting up a Christmas party, but when the time came, no one he invited showed up. Ooh. It's not really all that important, but a reference like this. That kind of that's gonna fucking destroy you for the rest of your life. But then again, one has to wonder: if you put in this much work into your own party and no one showed up, does that mean that the friends are shitty, or were they never your friends in the beginning? And one has to ask, what did you do as an individual for other people to not even show up to a party like this? This has to be more nuanced. It's not like this guy's some nicest kid ever and everyone else is a villain, right? Like, what's going on here? All this work into setting up a Christmas party, but when the time came, no one he invited showed up. That's sad. It's not really all that important, but a reference like this once again highlights that generational gap between him and Nanahoshi. Yes, boomers We're and zoomers. We're shown yet again through media the type of content Rudy grew up with. As for the other concerns, consideration needed to be given for how certain people may interact with each other. Like, with Linnea and Persena having bad blood with Ariel- <laughs> Holy shit, there's a lot of beast girls right over here. Hold up, hold up. The two of them accosted Princess Ariel with about 20 of their followers. It'd be nice to see, right? So Linnea and Persena has, like, their followers as well. I don't think we ever really get to see them, right? With In the anime, anyways. With Linnea and having bad blood with Ariel, who knows how they would react when they see her again. And knowing exactly how Ariel was, it's likely she would use this reception as her own personal networking event. She did. There was no way she would miss an opportunity to make acquaintance with the other special students. Seating was a whole nother issue on its own, because when your guests are royalty, nobility, adventurers, and slaves, you couldn't possibly seat them in- <laughs> Nobility, adventurers, and then you got fucking slaves. When your guests are royalty, nobility, adventurers, and slaves, 
you can't have Julie sitting at the same, you know, row, the same section as Princess Ariel. That's fucked up! I know it's customs, but come on, Julie's one of her own. You couldn't possibly seat them in order of status properly. Oh my god. Especially if you wanted to keep groups like Xanaba and Julie together. So, rather than make the mistake of seating someone with lower status ahead of someone with higher status, Rudy instead just opted for no seating at all. Smart. It was the best way to circumvent the whole issue with status. Julie, you're not allowed to see. Get out of the house. It's also the reason he instructed everyone to come in uniform since while there was definitely a gap in status, it wouldn't be as apparent if everyone came dressed the same. Right, because like Princess Ariel and like the nobility could come up in like full drip, but then the rest of us poors, you know, especially Julie, bro. She wearing a fucking potato bag. Someone get Julie new clothes, please. I mean, what she's wearing isn't bad. She was really cute there with the little, you know, manner, the well-cultured little bow there. Like, you know, she's she's they got some went and bought one nobility. The, the, this kind of bow, like, regular slaves would never know how to do this, right? This is some, like, high-class shit, right? This is just one of the many things they left out on Julie's end, and as you'll soon see, they're all brief scenes of her acting cute. Got it. Switching back to the preparations first, though. Although the anime doesn't make it visible with Rudy's design, shopping for a new robe was actually quite essential for him. Why? This is the same robe he's been traveling with Season ever one. since the Demon Continent, True. and while Sylvie herself didn't care that it was in tatters, the people Rudy associated with likely did. <laughs> hey! Who remembers this girl right over here in the far right? Oh my god, is, is Sarah gonna show up to the wedding? Sarah's definitely gonna get the invitation to the show up to the wedding, right? Sarah has to show up. Oh my god. I wonder if she's gonna fucking crash the wedding. She is turning point three. When everyone says, you know, maybe, uh, what's his name? Cliff is gonna be, like, the main person because he's, um, uh, like, church affiliated, right? You need, like, uh, some church person to oversee the wedding. And then it's like, does anybody, what, what's the part of the wedding? Or you basically says, does anyone, is everyone okay with this, right? Is there anyone that has any complaints? Is anyone going to say no? And the door fucking opens. It's Sarah. No, I think at that point, some kind of teleportation will happen. So it wasn't so much Selfie wanting to make Rudy look less disheveled, but rather a necessity for if he wanted to be part of Ariel's camp now. Selfie would maintain her Fitz identity as she walked into the store, and this would be the reason why Bald. the shop owner had recognized her. Baldi! It was a place Ariel and Luke came to as regulars, and that made it clear it was a shop that catered to a Surin royalty. Luke actually came here more than Ariel did, and every time he did, there would always be a different girl with him. Oh yeah, there was that one episode. It was, this is back in like season 2 part 1, when Ariel was like in, in the shop, right? And there was something sussy going on. Ariel and Luke was there. I'm like, what's going on here? But okay, this is like, you know, where the rich people show up. And royalty. Luke actually came here more than Ariel did, and every time he did, there would always be a different girl. Got a harem. Bro got a harem. Now, there was actually purpose behind each of these robes, and both... Someone has to fucking put Rudy in like a... Like, take the middle one and just like edit it and make a supreme logo on it, bro. And have him like pose like this. It'd be so funny, bro. Catered Drip to the elemental Rudy. specialties Rudy had mentioned earlier. For water, this was made from the hide of rainforest lizard, and that was a material that was supposed to be highly water resistant. Earth. For earth, this was made from the hide of Begarit's great earthworms, and they were supposedly durable earthworms. sandstorms. The reason Rudy decided not Shai to take either, though, was because his experience with rainforest lizards proved they weren't that resistant to water at all, and the camo of the desert one just seemed out of place it's here. It's kinda cringe. Had it been something a bit more snow-like, then this second robe was a purchase he would have made for sure. As for the last, this was a more subdued design typically chosen by older people. <laughs> it was made from the hide of the D-rank Lucky Rat, and this was a superior species Lucky rat. to the Mucky Rat. Only Lucky Rat?! Mucky rats? We're just rhyming and we're also gray rat. I guess it kind of makes sense that we're going to be wearing rat hide for our clothing. He once had Rudy ever come across either of these monsters, but it was when he did that he was terrified of them. Something about a horde of 20 inch rats just didn't sit well with him, mm. especially when the lucky rat was even bigger than that. Luckily, their skin boasted resistance to acid and poison, so right. in general, the robe was quite the useful one. So, acid and poison resistance sounds like pretty damn good, you know, a resistance to have in the future. So, whenever there comes a time when there's poison or acid stuff, be aware. Remember, this is gonna come in clutch. Or maybe it's never gonna come in clutch. Who knows? You just have to look past the price tag, making it equivalent to a house in the demon continent. Then, damn. after that, the robe really was rather nice. Well, a house in the demon continent probably doesn't cost as much, right, as a house like in the Asura Kingdom, right? Because... 
you know, pricing of houses is going to be based upon like the cost of living and the quality of life in certain places. The demon continent, probably not that good, right? These houses probably are relatively cheap, but for a jacket to be worth a house like that, that's pretty significant. To look past the price tag, making it equivalent to a house in the demon continent, then after that, the robe really was rather Bros nice. wearing a house. So the measurements for that would then be taken and the rope handcrafted and delivered within the next three days. The two would then proceed with the rest of their shopping and it's here they would have that conversation. Dude, the light novel covers just really makes them look like all like shoujo characters, man. It's something about the eyes and the way to their makeup right over here, right? It's the bright red. It's, it's the pale white skin tone with like warm eyeshadow orange red pink hues everybody got that going they all have the same fucking eye makeup bro that's why they look like shoujo characters and extremely pointy like chiseled facial structures like features right over here the nose the chin about rudy not thinking he was good enough for her of course selfie reassured him that he was but if there was anything he could improve on it would be his confidence you see, Silphy believed Rudy could be a bit too submissive sometimes, so in an effort <laughs> to make him less, she straight up told him to be more assertive. Be more assertive. It's an important line that I think- <laughs> Silphy was like, bro, you a beta bitch, bro. You gotta fucking be more assertive. Come on, be a fucking man. Listen to fucking Hustlers University. You gotta watch some Andrew Tate videos, bro. Why is such a fucking limp dick motherfucker? Highlights how it is Silphy sees Rudy right All right. Now. Though she always pictures him on this Be more aggressive, pedestal, Rudy. He's not a perfect entity she's afraid to criticize. No. He's simply the person she wants to support the most in life. This would then bring us to the bath scene, and while there was a whole section on Rudy teaching Silphy how to bathe properly, there wasn't anything too important in- What?! Rudy taught Silphy how to bathe properly. What do you, what do you fucking mean? You wash your body. You telling me Sophie never fucking washed behind her ears or fucking ass crack? She never fucking washed her ass crack? Is like what, what are you fucking talking about? How, this like that, that that that's like teaching someone how to eat. That's like teaching how to someone fucking drink. It's like you go in the bath and you fucking clean yourself. What the fuck was she not doing this entire time? The section on Rudy teaching Sophie how to bathe properly. There wasn't anything. What was she missing? Between all that, it would simply remind them of how it was the first time they met, and the two would reminisce on how they ended up together. Rudy would also right. Rudy basically waterboarded Sophie in the beginning, and then accidentally called accidentally called her a boy, and then made Sophie cry, and then she fell in love with them. Riz, Who would main character Riz, ended up together. Rudy would also show his appreciation for bathing in general, since while he never really got around to it in his past life. Oh, bro, what the fuck, dude? Show me, dude. This this is the fucking scene. Where, look at his hand. Look at his hand motion, bro. Look look at look at Rudy right now. Since while well, he never really got around to it, in his <laughs> he's stroking. Life, he found doing. He's stroking his schmeet. Quite relaxing. Silphy would also take the occasional peek at Rudy, and the rest was Rudy practicing self control. <laughs> sure. Now it's when we get to the wedding reception a few days after that there were a whole bunch of interactions cut, which developed the side characters. These brief yet interesting moments, which I found added charm to a lot of them. The first came from Linnea and Persena, and it was through their early arrival two hours before the event was even scheduled to start. You see, for them this was a display of loyalty. Two hours As early! In peace folk culture, when attending a wedding it was customary to go hunting the morning of, make a kill, then really? offer said kill as the gift. That's actually nice! I thought they only showed up to eat the food and leave, but because like in the anime it really did seem like they didn't give a fuck about anything else other than just showing up for the free food and leaving. But apparently they showed up early and actually brought, you know, a boar they hunted as a gift. And then the meat was made from that. So now they don't they look way better. The earlier one went hunting, made their kill, then returned with it, were all measures of respect for the person who invited them. So for Linnea and Persena to show up two hours early, all with this massive boar they had hunted just this morning, well, that was a tremendous display of their loyalty. It was them showing Rudy how much they truly respected him. Okay. It was one hour later that Zanibar Julie and Julie would arrive, then 30 minutes- Julie looks very different, huh? Julie looks way different in the manga or the light novel. And who is this girl right beside Luke? No, this is Luke's harem. After Ariel and her attendants. They were introduced as Elmoy Blue Wolf and Cleanne Elrond. Clean Elrond. Elmoy Blue Wolf. I wonder if these names are important. I like Cleon's design. She's got a little cute cat face, cat mouth. And the two were surprisingly close to Sylphie despite us never having seen them before. Really? In fact, 
When everyone was conversing later on in the party, Rudy could actually spot Elmoy in tears as she spoke about how happy she was for Sylphie. Really? It was clear she and Cleanne really cared for her. Especially Shit, when you like remember the NPC three one and two numerous battles together. Like Rudy when? Would then make <laughs> we a never see any. People having last names combining a color and an animal, then Ariel would step forward and present the gifts she'd brought. The first was an apple. Wait, 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 wait. Oh yes, ass. Maybe someone had a last name ass. A joke about people having White last ass. Names combining a color and an animal, then okay. Ariel would step forward and present the gifts she'd brought. The first was an aphrodisiac Rudy was more than familiar with, then mm. the next was a wooden dildo for in case Rudy couldn't do his job anymore. Oh my god. It was... <laughs> I, it looked like a handle to me because it was all blur. A wooden dildo. I... <laughs> where's the... Where... <laughs> you gotta bring like a strap-on component to it too, unless, he, unless Rudy just uses, you know, just with his hands. <laughs> Rudy should be able to make his own dildo with the earth magic he has, right? He, he, he can construct, you know, the figurines and stuff, right? He's really good at that. So, like, he should be able to make his own dildo. <laughs> like, an additional, like, part he could just attach to his dick when it's not fucking working or something, bro. They were both presented in the most serious manner you could imagine, okay. and that was because in Asura, stuff like that was completely normal. Mm. For a nation as promiscuous as theirs, it makes sense for gifts like Got a lot of people, new people coming in saying, oh my god, why are you streaming so early? What is it? Ask yourself what day it is and everything will make sense. Every fucking weekend, we have people coming in. You're so early! What are you doing right now? Oh my god! Just ask yourself what day it is and everything, I promise you. You can basically answer your own questions if you just think about it for a second. Like these to be part of their culture. It's actually something that I briefly talked about back in my... What's their culture? It's completely normal. For a nation as promiscuous as theirs, it makes Asura Kingdom is very promiscuous. Handing over dildos as gifts is like common, huh? Hmm, okay. Sense for gifts know. like these to be part of their culture. It's actually something that I briefly talked about back in my episode zero cut content from almost a year ago. Ah, <sighs> what are we gonna do about these? Uh it's too late, right? I don't think people are gonna be watching, you know, cut content like this from previous episodes of the season when it's not even airing. If there's other action Mushoku Tensei content that's not episode specific, but more about like the systems, the different mechanics in the world, that would be interesting to react to. In any case, Rudy would guide Ariel into the common area where a bit of tension would build between her and the Beast Girls. Obviously, neither were going to start a fight, but Rudy made sure by giving Linnea and Persena the look. He would even glance at Xanaba in order to tell him to keep those two in check, but Xanaba instead took that as an invitation to introduce himself. A display okay. of refined social skills which reminded Rudy that he too was What a was gentleman. Loyalty. Of course, he didn't go very long without praising Rudy, but that was par for the course when it came to any conversation with him. It was Cliff, Elena Lise, and Nanahoshi who showed up last, and to Rudy's surprise, they had all arrived together. They're Nanahoshi rude then. Didn't act if you arrive late, does not mean you're being extremely rude. Well, according to Beast Girl culture, right? The, the Beast Girl showed up like two hours early. She walked with them, but she was hovering outside the gates looking all flustered. Naturally, Alina Lise urged her to come with them, and that was how the three ended up showing up together. It was when Cliff heard that Nenahoshi was Silent Seven Star that he would seven immediately star? go and introduce himself. You're a Seven Stars. Oh, it's like the alias for Nenahoshi at this academy, right? For some reason, he wanted to know whether she had heard of him. Probably to inflate his ego, and that's exactly what had happened when she responded saying she did. <laughs> Nenahoshi would then go and speak to Rudy, and she would basically confirm that he was serious. If there was any doubt in him not wanting to go back to Earth, then it was all pretty much gone with this marriage here. Alina Lise and Cliff would then head straight into the common area, and the two wouldn't hesitate to converse with anyone. Despite Alina Lise's status being just above that of Julie's, it was clear that Right, because there's royals, nobility, adventurers, <laughs> and then slave. That's crazy that an adventurer is just like right above a slave, bro. That such a thing meant nothing to her. She had no problem interacting with anyone. Oh, 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 Rudy to think perhaps the notion. That's crazy. With more context, like straight up grandma right now, just like going after little young boys, the young boy hunter, with young boy hunter, ready, not easy. Leading Rudy to think perhaps the notion of rank meant nothing to elves. The same couldn't be said for Cliff, though, since while I'm sure he was aware of what status meant to everyone, he had no problem stifling the mood preaching about how great he was. Oh? Of course, Selena Lise made it a bit more bearable, but... 
I guess Selena Lise. What? What? Of course, Selena Lise. Made Selena Lise. Is that like a meme? Is that some kind of reference or mispronunciation? I don't know. But Cliff in the anime seemed a lot more reserved. Now it's like the cut content makes him seem like a little bit more like a douchebag. A bit more bearable, but just like Zanaba and his praise for Rudy, this too was just part of who he was as a person, even if it did come off as direct rather than endearing. Nenahoshi was a lot more social than you may think, since while the anime showed really? her tucked away in the corner, she did- She only gave a fuck about the potato chips, and then she left. Well, that's not really true, but she was most excited about the potato chips. ...make conversation whenever someone approached her. It wasn't anything deep or important, but she wasn't just this wallflower actively avoiding everyone. Especially later on when Julie and Bodyguardi join her. Since we're on the topic of Bodyguardi now, his arrival was standard behavior for pretty much every Demon King. Right, it's every Demon King does this. It's like, showing up late to hype up everything is something we should be grateful for, I think was his logic. As it is according to their culture, whenever a Demon King attends a party, they must always wait for the perfect moment to astonish and disrupt. The perfect moment, just like as soon as the main speech is happening, just crash the fucking thing. So, even the wedding then! What about the wedding? Now, a wedding is different from a party. But, like, if Body God is invited to the wedding, will he, like, show up at the very end when, he's, when people say any objections, right? Remember how we just said that? And it's like, maybe Sarah's gonna show up. Sarah's not gonna fucking show up. Body Gotti! What if Body Gotti shows up? Any objections? Body Gotti fucking busts down the fucking door. I have one! And then I don't know what he would say after that. It was a silly custom created by Kashirika herself. One she made up completely on a whim, yet one bodyguard he still followed despite knowing it was ridiculous. What the fuck, really? In the novel, he had come through the back door like some kind of robber, while in the manga, he straight up came through the chimney like he was Santa Claus. What? Obviously, that's a little ridiculous for- That would have been hilarious to animate. He should have fucking came down the chimney, bro. Someone his size, but it's definitely hilarious to see him crawling out like this. Now, it was after the speech and a little more socialization that a few minor interactions were omitted from the after party. Julie would sit next to Nanahoshi and eat <laughs> chips without saying. <laughs> Look at Nanahoshi peeking at Julie the side eye while eating potato chips. <laughs> anything, then Bodyguardi would come up after and join both of them. Whether it was because Bodyguardi was intimidating or she just wanted to protect her chips, out of pure instinct, Nanahoshi would pull out one of her rings. <laughs> she was clearly in a panic as this massive figure approached her. I mean, he's kind of massive. It'd be kind of intimidating. Anything, but he did mess up her hair as he casually played around with both of them. This would spur Nanahoshi to leave and go talk to Rudy, which in turn brings us to that important question Sylphie had asked to her. An interesting comment I'm surprised they didn't show along. You said before, oh yeah, from Japan, right? But that's the episode we are talking to Nanahoshi and then Sylphie was just getting ignored. With it was another line from Sylphie stating that she knew Nanahoshi wasn't from here. The reason I say I'm surprised is because the inclusion of it adds a whole nother layer to this. You see, if Sylphie knows Nanahoshi's from a different world, then her initial question means she suspects Rudy might be from one too. This is the first time such a topic has ever been mentioned by someone close to him, so it leads to a perspective of Rudy that we haven't yet seen before. One in which we get to see how he treats the idea of other people knowing he's, well, different. So, after Sylphie had asked the question of what she meant, Nanahoshi would glance at Rudy as if to ask what to do. She had left it entirely up to him, since for her such a detail wasn't hers to tell. Rudy's response may not be what you expect, since for him, he honestly didn't care what Nanahoshi said. Whether she told the truth or just brushed it off, the fact he was isekai'd wasn't something he was trying to hide from Sylphie. But we still have it hidden. Like, we never told Sylphie the details, like, yo, that was a piece of shit, disgusting loser back home. And then I died and came here and then groomed you. I, he didn't really gr I don't know. That's up for debate. But like, he, Sylphie doesn't know the exact details of what's going on with Rudy, right? He thought the topic would be a bit difficult to explain, but her knowing it wasn't that hmm. big of a deal for him. I feel like you're getting married to this girl. And this is a huge secret that you haven't told her. Will it be brought up at a certain point? I never really thought that. I don't know. The, the anime hasn't really been. The anime has not been confronting that idea, and I was like, kind of forgotten that until now. I'm like, hold the fuck up, we are an Isekai character, we're from Japan, and he hasn't really told her anything about it. Is this going to be a problem in the future? If anything, it's more important for us as the viewer, since the reveal of such knowledge suggests she already suspects it. 
Hmm. At the very least, it presents the concept uh -oh. of being uh -oh. isekai as common knowledge. Well, as it would seem for Nanahoshi's case anyway. This brings us now to Alina Lise and Silky, Grandma. which was done surprisingly well considering the amount of information packed within. The majority of it was captured almost perfectly, but for a bit more context you should definitely check out the manga. An entire side chapter was dedicated to explaining it. Well, at least hinting towards it since the only hint before that was the one from episode 4. Yeah, that accessory saw it, and then Adina Dizzy at that point decided to back off with Rudy, right? So, it was in chapter 79.5 that Elmoy had gone and done an investigation on Rudy and Alina Lise. It was from this that Silphie first heard she was- This NPC character? Thing, and it was that revelation which made her remember a conversation she once had. The conversation where her father first spoke about her grandmother. So, what the anime and- Whoa! Whoa, 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 whoa. Conversation where her father first spoke- This is her dad. This is Sylphie. Sylphie's dad. Do we- uh, What happened to her parents? In season one, when we first met Sylphie, the parents were around? They all died from the Mana disaster? I forget the details of Sylphie's parents. Are they dead? Or are they just missing and we're trying to find them as well and we just kind of forgot? They're just dead? Alright, they dead about her grandmother. So, what the anime and novel portrayed as Sylphie simply telling Alina Lise was instead shown as a flashback between her and Laws. What makes this so interesting is that, in addition to all the stuff about how Alina Lise was a troublemaker, we also get to see how it was Laws found out about her through Paul. Laws is Sylphie's dad? Before that, he didn't like Alina Lise too much yes. either, but after hearing how she was while she traveled with Paul, such amazing stories made him think that perhaps she changed a bit. Sophie the person Paul lies. described was far different mm. from the outcast everyone else did. It was a different perspective that made Laws think perhaps her and Sylphie should meet one day. It was this conversation which stuck with Sylphie over the years, and that would be the reason why she was even aware of Alina Lise. So, the reception would take a bit of a somber turn here, but with Bodyguardi constantly laughing in the background, <laughs> he alone would keep the mood light. That's crazy. <laughs> so like, it's like a wedding party. Everyone's having fun. And suddenly it's just like, boom. Irina Rize. Oh my god, I'm your grandmother. And everyone's fucking sobbing, crying in the corner. It's kind of like awkward, right? And the vibes are kind of like off. It's like, uh-oh. It's, it's a bit personal. And body guy's just in the fucking back. Like, ha 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 ha. I fucked your grandmother too. And everyone's just like, ha 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 ha. And he just kept the party going. Don't forget that. Body got it back shot. Body got it netty netty safe. That did happen. Not once did he come up to congratulate Rudy or Selfie, but his lively presence was something Rudy was grateful for. Giga chat, body got it. Now, it was once people started to leave that the only other notable interaction was between Nanahoshi and Luke. As you'd expect from oh, Luke someone flirting. as womanizing as him, it was only natural for him. Luke is a womanizer, huh? I didn't know. I thought he just naturally had girls gravitating towards him. Because every time we saw him in season two, part one, he seemed a little arrogant and always had like a harem around him. But he was always a womanizer from the start, huh? Okay. I mean, aren't most gray rats? Like Paul, Luke, Rudy. What other gray rats do we know? Fucking, what was that guy's name? Jeff? Was that Eris' dad's name? Was that was his name fucking Jeff? I forget. Him to try and hit on Nanahoshi at least once that day. He was feigning what interest in topics he thought she might be passionate about. Like what, what? What could you possibly have in common? He should bait her with potato chips and be like, "Oh, you want you want some potato chips? I can make some potato chips." I do remember Eris' grandpa. They're a degenerate fucking you know furry freaks, bro. They made the girls you know act like fucking cat girls, bro. That ain't normal for a grandpa to groom the granddaughter to behave like a cat girl. But we ignore that because anime logic. Out, but no attempt at conversation could dissuade his annoying presence. So the more Luke spoke, the more Nanahoshi got annoyed, and eventually she would have to run to the bathroom just to escape. Him. Ella That's raised. when she figured it was time to leave, and the rest was pretty much as we saw. Nanahoshi left because of Luke. Luke just was like, nope. Nanahoshi ain't having any of it, bro. This brings us now to the duel between Luke and Rudy, but oh, this that's is sad. something that I feel is worthy of its own video. What? Its own video? Oh, and someone did say Maddox. Didn't just say we're going to get like a part two from any news about that, so maybe this is the video that's going to be dropping today. It's one I actually plan to release tomorrow, so yeah. you should keep your eye out for that one. Okay, now, okay. Don't forget the big giveaway stream is Yes, happening. hashtag ad. Go to Mr. Annie News' channel. Sub to him. 
like his videos, get in the giveaway. Thank you for, as usual, for the cut content. That's some funny shit. That body got it came down from a chimney that we didn't even fucking know. Or like the fact that Julie's a fucking slave that we know, but like, you know, the seating arrangements, like we don't want to make them feel left out. It's kind of, you know, mean. But this sword fight against, you know, Luke, it was so fast in the anime, but I'm sure it had a lot of meaning behind it because Princess Ariel obviously wants to see Rudy. Are you really that guy? I need like powerful connections as we go into the Asura Kingdom take back arc, which is going to happen way later, but she's starting to plot the seeds. So maybe that's what she was scouting for. But that's it from me. Bye bye.